knew he lived. And I just put, I thought, well, he must be a sir by now. Sir Robert Graves, Mallorca. And the answer came back, dear Lady Jean Moorcroft <laughs> Wilson. The story is quite true, etc., etc. In a flamboyant green felt tip, I'm going to sell those one day, don't worry. <laughs> and I, I was delighted by this, and he said, I'm coming to London to give a poetry recital. Can you give me your telephone number? And I'll phone. So I felt terribly privileged, so I gave him my telephone number, which was in one of those bed sitting rooms, you know, with the landlady's son shouting, Miss Wilson, telephone call. <laughs> so this duly arrived, and I said, who is it? He said, calls himself someone like Robert Waves. <laughs> By which time, of course, I was absolutely terrified and went to the phone and said, hello. <laughs> he said, meet me at the stage door afterwards. <laughs> this was at the end of his life, where he had a series of muses getting younger and younger. I think the only thing I fitted was the, the, the age profile. <laughs> I was too terrified, not because I thought I'd be the muse, although who knows, <laughs> but because it was Robert Graves. And you know, I went to the poetry reading, I heard Robert Graves, and I didn't go to the church door. But his eldest son by his second marriage, William, is, has become a great friend and is very keen on what I'm doing and has been to dinner twice. <laughs> I've never cooked so much in my life. <laughs> Sorry, I, get, I, got, I was going to get told off if I didn't tell you that story. <laughs> well, to turn to slightly less hilarious subjects, um, many claims have been made for W.G. Sebalt, perhaps the most relevant for our purpose, being something written by a man called, I'm probably mispronouncing it, Teju Cole, who wrote in The New Yorker in 2012 that... Sebald's works are the books of our history opened before us, a claim which the Irish novelist John Banville wholeheartedly endorses, and this is what he writes. And, and really, you don't need to listen to the rest of the lecture after you've heard John Banville. Sebald's importance, he argues, lay in the fact that uniquely among contemporary fiction writers, he had found a way through what Lionel Trilling calls the bloody crossroads where literature and politics meet. Beautiful phrase, isn't it? The four novels and one volume of prose poetry that he published all engage, however indirectly and subtly, with the catastrophic history of our time and of his time, specifically the Second World War, the Holocaust, and their aftermath. They do so in the most delicate, anti-dramatic, and moving fashion. Where others shout, Sebald murmurs, has there ever been a more devastating and yet wholly undemonstrative account of mid-20th century European horrors as Austerlitz? Sebald's final novel, his masterpiece, and one of the supreme works of art of our time, written also very fittingly, I think, the year he died, his own elegy. Austerlitz is a book, then, wholly concerned with the past and its history. When it opens in 1967, it's framing first narrator, and I say that because as you'll see, I hope you won't become too confused, there are two narrators. There's the man telling the story who is nameless, but whom, as I'll suggest, we think maybe is Sebald himself. And then the main narrator is Austerlitz, trying to remember, trying to recapture his past. Why he was brought up with foster parents in Wales. Why, indeed, was he called Austerlitz? It's not until halfway through the book as he stands in the disused ladies' waiting room in Liverpool Street Station, extraordinary place to discover about one's past, that he remembers arriving by train at Liverpool Street Station, and later still, when a chance radio broadcast on the kinder transport is broadcast 
he hears about his own past. He understands as he listens. The past, or the history, Austerlitz is trying to recover is, of course, the Holocaust which has deprived him of his Jewish Czechoslovakian parents and his birthplace, Prague. And it is the Holocaust in one form or another, however indirectly, which forms the central concern of the book and of all his novels. He didn't write many, and some of you have bravely tackled some of them, I know, last year, which was a, a delight for me. Vertigo, um, written in, in, in English translation. He wrote them in German and then had them very carefully translated into English with his complete supervision. 1999, the English version. The Emigrants, 1996 in the English version. The Rings of Saturn, 1998 in the English version. And then our book. Austerlitz, the only, I would say, genuine novel of the lot, and even then, it's debatable. The Holocaust also figures largely, though at times even more obliquely, in Sebald's essays and poetry, because quite apart from his busy life as a lecturer in foreign literature, he also wrote poetry and novels and memoirs. The volume of poetry is called Across the Land and the Water. And this is what the critic says as he's reading it, and it's my poem for the day by Sebald. Some of these later poems are bracingly concise, the critic says, and then proceeds to quote the one that I think should take us straight into the Holocaust. Somewhere behind Turkenfelt, a spruce nursery, a pond in the moor on which the March ice is slowly melting. It's a fine little idyllic lyric. You can just see it, can't you, from the train as you're going past. We're looking at a small German town, probably from that passing train. But the meaning of the poem darkens irrevocably irre when you realize what behind Turkenfelt means. It's a location of one of the 94 subcamps linked to Dachau. And it was a station on the railway linking Dachau with the munitions towns of Kaufering and Landsberg. Sebart leaves all this out of the poem. It's rather like his novels. So much is left out, so much implied including the fact that this railway was called the Blutbahn, the blood track, and that many thousands were transported on this very route to their deaths. As ever, he draws us into history's shadow in an indirect way. There's nothing frontal about his attack. The date, 1967, the year the unnamed narrator meets Austerlitz as the novel opens, seems to me anything but arbitrary. Since it was only two years after Sebald himself had finally become aware of the horrors of the concentration camps. Now, this is very strange because he was born in 1944, and you would think, wouldn't you, that by 1967 he might have had a glimpse of what had gone on. But it was, wasn't until the Frankfurt Auschwitz trials, which he attended in person, that he began to realize what indeed his past included. The Frankfurt Auschwitz trials, known in German as the Auschwitz Prozess, or der Schweizer Auschwitz Prozess, the second Auschwitz trial, was a series of trials running from December the 20th, 1963 to August the 19th, 1965. Charging 22 defendants under German criminal law for their roles in the Holocaust, but they were only minor officials. The first Auschwitz trial had been in Poland in 1947 when people like Hess had been, had been charged. But for, for Sebald himself, this was the moment, because although it wasn't the most important of the trials, it was the one where he personally was present and heard these people who had themselves been present. 
The court's proceedings at Frankfurt were largely public and brought many details out that had not been previously known, brought them to the attention of the ordinary Germans, who quite understandably were uncomfortable and not entirely willing to face their past. It seems to me no coincidence that he left Germany for England in 1966, the following year, after the trials ended. The things he had learnt there were to scar his life forever. And initially, as I said last year, I thought this must mean that he had a Jewish background himself. But surprisingly, it emerges that there was no Jewish blood at all in his family. In fact, quite the opposite. His father had been in the German army all the way through the 30s, part of the 20s, and had been one of the first of the German troops who went into Poland in 1939. And in that war, he was taken prisoner and did not come home until three years after his son's birth. So he, he must have come home and then left for the front again in 1943-1944, which was when Sebald was born, and then not come home until 1967. So, and when he came back, like so many people who'd been in the army, and not just Germans, he didn't want to talk about it. He was unwilling to say anything, and so there was what was known as the conspiracy of silence. So soon, uh, sorry, so soon. <laughs> Sebald's own explanation is that when he finally discovered that he was born in the same month that Kafka's sister was deported to Auschwitz, it's bizarre, he wrote. You're pushed in a pram through the flowering, fl flowering meadows and a few hundred miles to the east these horrendous things are happening. So he was aware, not at the time, but a lot later, he began to feel guilty and responsible, but only after he had heard those Auschwitz trials. It's the chronological contig contiguity that makes you think it's something to do with you, he said. I thought that was very interesting. The fact that he felt guilty almost by association of place because he was brought up very near Munich. Sebald also points out that his father had made the grade during the fascist years, and that made him feel even worse, because the rise of the family was partly because his father had gone into the army, had become a captain, and then, as post-war Germany recovered, had risen in the social scale. The German economic miracle, as, it called, un as it's called, unfolded, so the family rose into the middle classes which was something they hadn't enjoyed before. They'd been largely a farming family before. It was that social stratum, Sebald wrote, where the so-called conspiracy of silence was at its most present. Until I was 16 or 17, I had heard practically nothing about the history that preceded 1945. Only when we were 17, were we confronted with a documentary film of the opening of the Belsen camp. There it was, and we somehow had to get our minds around it, which of course we didn't. It was in the afternoon with a football match afterwards at places, it doesn't it? How are these boys of 17 to incorporate it into a world that has never included it? So it took years, he wrote, to find out what had happened. In the mid-1960s, I could not conceive, conceive that these events had happened only a few years back. Though Sebald had been just one year old when the war ended, so could hardly have had any impressions of that period of destruction based on personal experience, he tells us. Yet whenever he afterwards saw photographs or documentary films dating from the war, Sebald felt, and I quote from a wonderful interview that was um, held with him just before he died. Nobody knew he was going to die. He died very suddenly of a heart attack in the face of a, an oncoming lorry. He was driving his car, so nobody knew he was going to die. But when he, when he looked at it afterwards, he wrote in that last interview, 
I felt as if I were its child, the child of that war, so to speak, as if those horrors I did not experience had cast a shadow over me and one from which I shall never entirely emerge. After school, he studied German literature at Freiburg University, getting his degree in 1965. He then went to work as a research assistant. As I suggested, he got out of Germany almost as soon as he could after those trials. And in 1967, he was a research assistant in Manchester, and um, so just, just two years after those trials. Um, and it preoccupied me all the more when I came to England, he said, because in Manchester, I realized for the first time that these historical events had happened to real people. One character in The Emigrants in 1930, 1993 was based partly on his Mancunian Jewish landlord. Apparently, they hadn't known any Jews because there were no very few Jews around as he was growing up. You could grow up in Germany, he writes, in the post-war years without ever meeting a Jewish person. It's something I haven't thought of, actually. There were small communities in Frankfurt or Berlin, but in a provincial town in South Germany, Jewish people didn't exist. The subsequent realization that they had been in all those places, doctors, cinema ushers, owners of garages, but had disappeared, or had been disappeared, was dreadful. So it was a process of successes, successive phases of realization. In 1967, he also married his Austrian wife, Ute, and they had one daughter. She survived the car accident. And in 1970, he became a lecturer at the University of East Anglia, which is well known in England for its creative writing course, and for Andrew Motion, who was there for a time. Everybody loves Andrew Motion. I don't quite know why. And in 1987, he became a professor of European literature in the same university. And in 1989, he became the founding director of the British Centre for Literary Translation. So he's always been very much involved in literature and in translation, but so strange that he should write them in German and have them translated by somebody else, isn't it? This permanent departure from his homeland certainly inspired one of his most recurring themes, and that is exile. Everybody seems exiled. Even the unnamed narrator who opens Austerlitz seems somewhat exiled. The very fact that we don't know his name gives him a curious flavor. The coinciding of dates between Sassoon, uh, sorry, I'll say that all the way through, you notice. Sebald's own fuller awareness of the horrors that had been, uh, that had been taking place the crimes that have been committed and his dating of the opening narrator's first meeting marks, um, makes it tempting to conflate him with the narrator. And I think whatever he said, to the contrary, there is a great deal of Sebald in the first narrator. I read you about his first meeting with Austerlitz, whom he doesn't know in 1967. When I entered the great hall of the central station. This is um, extract two. When I entered, and this is Amsterdam. When I entered the great hall of the central station with its dome arching 60 meters high above it, my first thought, perhaps triggered by my visit to the zoo, because there was a little zoo in the railway station which he's just visited, perhaps triggered by my visit to the zoo and the sight of the dromedary, was that this magnificent, although then severely dilapidated foyer, ought to have cages for lions and leopards let into its marble niches. Just think how exciting to go on a train that would be. And aquaria for sharks, octopuses, and crocodiles, just as some zoos, conversely, have little railway stations in which you can, so to speak, travel to the farthest corners of the earth. He's got a very good sense of humor, a very dry sense of humor, but nevertheless, it's there throughout, even with this horrific subject. It was probably because of ideas like these um, that 
occurring to me almost of their own accord there in Amsterdam, that the waiting room, which I, I know has now been turned into a staff canteen, struck me another, as another nocturama. Now, nocturama is for night creatures. So you go in, it's completely dark, and all you can see are the lights of the eyes shining out at you, which may, of course, have been the result of the sun's sinking behind the city rooftops, just as I entered the room. The gleam of gold and silver on the huge, half-obscured mirrors on the wall facing the window was not yet entirely extinguished before a subterranean twilight filled the waiting room, where a few travelers sat apart, silent and motionless. Like the creatures in the Nocturama, which had included a strikingly large number of dwarf species, tiny fennec, foxes, spring hares, hamsters, the railway passengers seemed to me somehow miniaturized. And then he goes on about that and the last sentence. One of the people waiting in the Salle de Pas Perdu was Austerlitz, a man who then, in 1967, appeared almost youthful, with fair, curiously wavy hair, of the kind I had seen elsewhere only on the German hero Siegfried in Fritz Lang's Nibelungen films. So there is that wonderful station at, um, this is actually Lucerne railway station, but it's something of the same impression of vastness. He loves vast architecture. The imagery of trains and of stations and waiting rooms are central to the novel, with their implications of travel and rootlessness and displacement, of course, they seem entirely at home in a novel like this. So too will his study, uh, Austerlitz's study, that is, of grandiose architecture. So beloved, of course, of, of Hitler, though he does not yet know the connection when he chooses to specialize in it, but he's drawn to architecture as though that almost brings him nearer to his roots. Susan Sontag, writing in the magazine Biblioclept as recently as 2013, asks, is this narrator, the one you've just heard, is the narrator Sebald, or a fictional character to whom the narrator has lent his name and selected elements of his biography. Some elements in Austerlitz suggest this strongly. And yet these books are asked rightly to be considered fiction. And I've always been fascinated by that question of whether fact and fiction end. Is, is something that is based on fact and made into fiction, is that a legitimate form? Is it something that we should encourage or not? doesn't matter whether we encourage it or not. It's very common nowadays, of course. I mean, think of Norman Mailer's um, In Cold Blood, do you know the book, in which he talks about an actual murder, but almost in fictional terms. And yet, these books, Susan Sontag says, ask rightly to be considered fictional. Fiction they are, not least because there is a good reason to believe that much is invented or altered just as surely some of what he relates really did happen. Names, places, dates, and all. And this is, I think, Susan Sontag at her best. Fiction and factuality are, of course, not opposed. One of the founding claims for the novel in English is that it is true history. Do you remember Defoe? The true history of Robinson Crusoe, the true history of of um, Mole Flanders, the true history of Jonathan, was it Jonathan Wilde? Anyway, the one about the high women. Um, what makes a work fiction, and this I found fascinating, is not that the story is untrue, it may well be true in part or in whole, but its use or extension of a variety of devices, including false or forged documents, which produce what the literary, um, what the literary, what the literary, good heavens, literary theorists call the effect of the real. 
Sebalt's fictions and their accompanying visual situations carry the effect of the real to a plangent extreme. This real narrator is an exemplary fictional construction. So whether it's Sebalt or not, she says, it doesn't matter. The promeneur solitaire, the solitary walker, wandering around the railway station, meeting unexpectedly with the strange man, Austerlitz. Of many generations of romantic literature, a solitary even when a companion is mentioned. It is impossible to tell how much of Austerlitz's narrative is based on fact, partly because Austerlitz himself is a complete cre composite creation, elusive and insubstantial at best. Behind Austerlitz, Sebald told that last interviewer, Maya Jaggi, behind Austerlitz hide two or three or perhaps three and a half real persons. One is a colleague of mine, and another is a person about whom I happen to see a Channel 4 documentary by sheer chance. I was captivated by the tale of an apparently English woman, Susie Bechhofer, Hoffer, who, as it transpired, had come to this country with her twin sister and had been brought up in a Welsh Calvinist household. One of the twins had died, and the surviving twin never really knew that her origins were in a Munich orphanage. It's things like this, of course, that give the novelist such material for thought. Maya Jaggi had noted in this same interview that Sebald's work combines genres, and by now I think you will know that. Autobiography, travel, meditative, es it is meditative essay, and also, of course, the novel and history. And blurs boundaries, she says, between fact and fiction, art and documentary. Teju Cole sees this blurring of boundaries as willful, it's quite deliberate, and believes that this expert mixing of forms owes a great deal to Sebald's reading of the 17th century mystics and melancholies, uh, Robert Burton and Thomas Brown. There's a great deal about that in The Rings of Saturn. Sebald's own statement on the subject was that the big events are true while the detail is invented. So he gives you no comfort at all. <laughs> like Susan Sontag told Charles Somery Smith in his review of Austerlitz, while agreeing that it is impossible to tell how much of this narrative, if any, is true, argues that it is lent veracity by its out-of-focus grey photographs of people and places. Most of all, the picture of, is it Austerlitz himself, with his distinctive wavy hair, looking out inquisitively at the photographer and dressed as for a fancy dress party in Prague just before the war. It is, in fact, a photograph of one of Sebald's own childhood friends. It was an area that Maya Jaggi picked up on in that last interview. What's your interest in photography, she asked, and why do you strike, strive for uncertainty in the reader about what's true? And he says, I've always been interested in photographs, and some of you will feel the same, I think. I certainly love the photographs in in um, Sebald, they're so intriguing. Um, I've be, always been interested in photographs, collecting them not systematically, but randomly. They get lost, then turn up again. You probably know the feeling. Two years ago, in a junk shop in the East End of London, I found a postcard of the yodeling group from my hometown. That is a pretty staggering experience, he said. These old photographs always seem to me to have appeal written into them, that you could tell the story behind them. I was absolutely intrigued by this photograph, which is very strange, with no explanation at all why a man with a parrot on his shoulder should be at a tea party with very suspicious looks being cast at him. And then, to my amazement in a true Seboldian experience, I was researching Robert Graves and found that his friend, um, who was called Evan Morgan, 
was really Lord Tredega, and guess which photograph of Tredega was shown. So I feel I was in the spirit of Sebald. And the photographs, I mean, I knew exactly what he meant, the sort of sheer staggering coincidence of that. Who was this man, I thought, for years as I read Austerlitz and looked at the photographs. And of course, he puts it in because it's just such an extraordinary photograph. I mean, what's all this about? One of my favorite photographs, actually. This, I won't tell you the story of Lord Tredega, which is in itself very intriguing. <laughs> The story Sebald appears anxious to authenticate in this way, because he is authenticating, falsely authenticating with photographs, isn't he? In Austerlitz is a curious one, and can only be unraveled backwards, as the main protagonist delves ever more deeply. So we enter at 19, 19, 1967, um, we go to 1997, we go back to 1940s, when his parents are in Prague, and so we move very, very randomly and confusingly through the story. But he does discover in the course of all his travels, his travels to Prague, to unravel his past, that he was the son of a moderately successful opera singer and the manager of a small slipper-making factory. Well, you couldn't have made that up, could you? And they were active left-wing uh, in left-wing politics, and they were also Jewish. Very dangerous combination at that time. The rise of the Nazi party in Germany and the subsequent German invasion of Czechoslovakia meant that his father had to flee to Paris, never to be seen again. His letter to his family was confiscated by the German authorities, and his mother managed eventually to convey her son to England by the kinder transport he got on, one of the last trains leaving from Prague. It's a very, very distressing story, the thought of those little children getting on that train, separated forever, certainly in this case, from their parents, and then to an entirely different world, the world of a nonconformist preacher and his wife, a childless couple who simply don't know how to parent him. It's very sad indeed. He's clever. He goes to a minor public school, which he intensely dislikes, apart from making friends with a younger boy, and is encouraged by his history teacher to study architecture, and then we go on with the story. Um, and then eventually he, he gets a job in London and lives in the East End of London. But all the time, he is still uncertain of his past, he is still searching for his past, and every now and again, he and that first narrator meet, and we catch up with the story. The confusion, I think, is deliberate, a mirroring of the confusion of those caught up in the events of the Holocaust, those children whose parents never came back, those children who simply couldn't understand for the first five, ten years of their life why they were somewhere else. The narrative is a tortuous one, forcing the reader to try to disentangle the story in very much the same way that Austerlitz <coughs> is trying to do so, and the narrator. It's undoubtedly deliberate, since it's clear by the end that Sebald's narrative possesses its own clean and almost relentless logic. Yet the author constructs chronological and geographical mazes, and the maze, like the railway station, is another of those very common images in the book. Lost, of course, in a maze. And if you saw the film on Tuesday, you will have seen that the maze also figures very largely in the rings of Saturn. Mazes become central to the image. The collapse in the actual style of the book, of mental equilibrium, um, not only in the character of Austerlitz, who collapses as the story progresses, but also in the style itself. Sometimes there are sentences that go on for nine pages. I don't want to put you off, but not an easy read. For example, the narrator meets up with Austerlitz in London on Saturday the 19th of March 1997, and we're furiously thinking, now this must be significant, you know, trying to work it out. And here's him recall his visit to a train station 
in 1984, which prompts a lengthy discourse on the construction of the station in 1860 and the relation of anecdote about explorations in the station's now disused waiting room. It's all very curious and very maze-like. But Austerlitz hardly gives this 1968 and 19, the 1981 is quickly replaced by the 1968 one. He quickly um, moves on and switches gear and recalls his sudden realization in 1984 that this train station waiting room was where he realized he'd come on a kinder transport. So it then becomes clear why we have gone through that confusion. This is, of course, the Madeleine moment in the book, where the connection with that room sparks the memory. But of course it doesn't, you see. It does and it doesn't, because he cannot recapture more than that. He cannot go back any further. And that, of course, is the true tragedy of his life, that he is left without a past. Of all Sebald's book, Austerlitz, deals most directly with the solid facts of German history, centering firmly then on the Second World War and the Holocaust. Very early on in the book, for example, inspired by Austerlitz's exhaustive treatise on the history of fortifications, when they meet in that railway station at the beginning, the unnamed narrator takes a train out to inspect a place just outside Amsterdam called Breendonk, a holding camp for prisoners on their way to the concentration camps in the Second World War. Sorry, there's Breendonk. I'll read you what he says about it, and you'll see why he likes this photograph of Breendonk. After the previous days, this is extract three, after the previous day's conversation, I still had an image in my head of a star-shaped bastion with walls towering above a precise geometrical ground, geometrical ground plan. But what I now saw before me was a low-built concrete mass, rounded at all its outer edges and giving the gruesome impression of something hunched and misshapen. The broad back of a monster, I thought, risen from this Flemish soil like a whale from the deep. I felt reluctant to pass through the black gateway into the fortress itself and instead began by walking around it on the outside through the unnaturally green, deep green, almost blue-tinged grass growing on the island. From whatever viewpoint I tried to form a picture of the complex, I could make out no architectural plan for its projections and indentations kept shifting, just of course as our grasp on the plot keeps shifting, far exceeding my comprehension, so that in the end I found myself unable to connect it with anything shaped by human civilization or even with the silent relics of our, pre, of our early prehistory and early history. And the longer I looked at it, the more often it forced me, as I felt, to lower my eyes, the less comprehensible it seemed to become. And of course, this all applies to our own view of the Holocaust in retrospect, covered in places, and so he goes on, ulcers with the raw crushed stone erupting from them, encrusted by guano-like droppings and calcareous streaks, the fort was monolithic, monstrous incarnation of ugliness and blind violence. Even later, when I studied the symmetrical ground plan with its outbreak of limbs and claws, with the semicircular bastions standing out from the front of the building like eyes and the stumpy projections at the back of its body, I could not, despite its now evident rational structure, recognize anything designed by the human mind but rather saw it as the anatomical blueprint of some alien and crab-like creature. The path round the fort led past the tarred black posts of the execution ground, and the labor site 
where the prisoners had to clear away the earthworks around the wall, walls, moving over a quarter of a million tons of soil and rubble with only shovels and wheelbarrows to help them. These wheelbarrows, one of which can still be seen in the anteroom of the fort, must have seemed terrifyingly primitive even then. Every word, of course, can be applied to our modern perception of what, what it was about, what it was all about. Brindonk is not the only camp visited in this much, um, it's much more explicit book about the Holocaust. Later in the story, when Austerlitz has followed up the few clues given him by his parents' neighbor, a woman called Vera, who has been his nursemaid in youth, he visits the camp his mother was first consigned to, Theresien, or Theresienstadt in German, before being sent further east to her death. So he knows now that his mother was almost certainly sent further east before she died. It's described in even more chilling detail than Breendonk, also with photographs. This sense of solid reality is further reflected in his fixation on architecture and the monuments of civilization, especially fortresses, train stations, and other grand buildings meant to withstand the onslaughts of time. This is the Palais de Justi Justice in, in Brussels. But by the end of the novel, this sense of solidity has vanished. Austerlitz, as Ted Goya notes in the new canon, seems to exist outside of time and place. Characters have the quality of ghosts and sometimes come across as less real than the dead. Sebald's writing seems on the surface to be deeply immersed in the day-to-day, -day, in the same way that these people seem real, but they're actually very, very spiritual in some way. Yet the more deeply one penetrates his stories, the more ethereal they become, existing less in the world around us and rather in the memories, dreams. There are a lot of dreams in this book, obsessions and volatile emotions of his characters. To tell the story of Austerlitz, therefore, as a wonderful critic, I don't know whether you've come across him, English, I'm proud to announce, a man called James Wood, whom I always read if I can possibly get hold of anything he's written. He argues in the London Review of Books that Austerlitz, and trying to understand Austerlitz, he says, represents a kind of vandalism. It leaves out, most importantly, all the ways in which Sebalt contrives not to offer an ordinary, straightforward recital. I hope this isn't depressing you too much. I always like to try to understand what I'm reading, but I do feel you have to allow yourself into Austerlitz and allow yourself to be confused. For what is so delicate is how Sebalt makes Austerlitz, Austerlitz's story a broken, recessed enigma whose meaning the reader must impossibly rescue. So you're all the time, you're, you're kind of mimicking what Austerlitz himself is trying to do. And it is not only because the truth of any situation is almost impossible to unravel, but also because of the history attached to such a sensitive subject. The Holocaust is very difficult to talk about. And to deny it, of course, has now become a criminal offense. It's a very, very sensitive subject, isn't it? As Sebalt explained when Maya Jaggi commented on his oblique and tentative approach to the Holocaust, his avoidance of the sensational, and he replied, in the history of post-war German writing, for the first 15 or 20 years, people avoided mentioning political persecution, the incarceration and system systematic extermination of whole peoples and groups in society. You remember the, the purging of whole groups of gypsies and Jews, and not just Jews, but gypsies too. Um, homosexuals, I believe, were another category. The incarceration and system, systematic extermination of whole peoples and groups in society. Then from 1965, this became a preoccupation of writers, not always in an acceptable form. 
So I knew that writing about the subject, particularly for people of German origin, is fraught with dangers and difficulties. Tactless lapses, moral and aesthetic, can easily be committed. It was also clear, he said, that you could not write directly about the horrors of persecution in its ultimate form, because no one could bear to look at these things without losing their sanity. So you would have to approach it from an angle, and by intimating to the reader that these subjects are constant company, their presence shades every inflection of every sentence one writes. If one can make that credible, then one can begin to defend writing about these subjects at all. He almost feels as though it's indelicate to approach the subject, and yet he also feels compelled to write about it. One of the ways in which Sebald removes his narrative from the actual reality is by the use of a narrator, which I've told you about. And this narrator, as we've seen, can become very, very confusing indeed. And yet, Austerlitz, perhaps even more powerfully than a direct description, manages to convey much of the horror and tragedy of the Holocaust. Sebald was not only the narrator, using the narrator to distance the story from us, to make it bearable, he also adjusts the narrative technique itself to, to um, achieve the same end. The book opens, um, therefore, with that unnamed narr narrator, then goes on to Austerlitz himself, and, and, and then goes back to the unnamed narrator, and all the way through, the narrator is shifting, so that we're getting a shifting point of view that makes it even more distressing. This constant shifting of narrative viewpoint fosters a sense of confusion, of living in a dream or nightmare, which reflects, of course, Austerlitz's own state. A similar effect is created by the style in which this rambling tale is told, for as Sebald himself explains in The Natural History of Destruction, it's a book, very much of a factual book about what happened after or at the end of the First, Second World War, his style is the result of the quest for a form of language in which experiences paralyzing the power of articulation could be expressed. That in itself is a miracle of a sentence. And you probably didn't take it in first time. You just have to go and read Sebald. And since the experiences Sebald is attempting to convey are highly disturbing, the ultimate effect of this novel is one of confusion and bewilderment. Stylistically, this effect is achieved partly through Sebald's mixing of highly realistic detail, as I've said, with a kind of ghostly impressionism. There's a description of Austerlitz visiting the um, Holocaust Museum at Theresienstadt. When, towards the end of the day, the museum's guard came up to me and indicated that she would soon have to close, said Austerlitz. This is extract four. I had just been reading several times over a note on one of the display panels to the effect that in the middle of December 1942, and thus at the very time when his mother, Agatha, came to Terezin, some 60,000 people were shut up together in this ghetto in the ghetto, a built-up area of one square kilometer at the most. And a little later, when I was out in the deserted town square again, it suddenly seemed to me, with the greatest clarity, that they had never been taken away at all, but were still living, crammed into those buildings and basements and attics, as if they were incessantly going up and down the stairs, looking out of the windows, moving in vast numbers through the streets and alleys, and even a silent assembly filling the entire space occupied by the air, hatched with gray as it was by the fine rain. So he almost feels as though they're still there with him. There's something very ghostly about it. Sebald's love of detail and lists many, leads to many 
scenes. I mean, there are a lot of hotels here, railway hotels, railway stations, big buildings. He takes us, for instance, on a detailed tour of the old Great Eastern Hotel in London. For those of us who are Londoners, of course, it means something. As Austerlitz is guided through it by its courteous Portuguese manager. Or to the disused ladies' waiting room that I've mentioned, where he discovers his memory is sparked into a, 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 the fact that he was brought there by kinder, the kinder transport. At a particularly bad point in his life, when he stopped being able to write even to think and has burned all his papers, Austerlitz describes a walk he takes in the night, well, in the very early morning. Geographically precise, as I know, and quite possible to take if you were silly enough to get up at that time in the morning, but ghostly. Look at extract five. For over a year, I think, said Austerlitz, I would leave my house as darkness, oh, sorry, so it's complete night time, isn't it? As darkness fell, walking on and on down the Mile End Road. Are you with me? Do you know where the Mile End Road is? And Bow Road, oh, I love this, because I love thinking about walking in London, you know? To Stratford, then to Chigwell and Romford, right across Bethnal Green and Canterbury, through Holloway and Kentish Town, and thus to Hampstead Heath, or else south over the river to Peckham and Dulwich, or westward to Richmond Park. Well, what is so interesting about this is, of course, you could take the walk. And yet the point of this walk is not that you could take it, is it? It's a very strange mixture of convincing you by the detail, and yet using the walk for another reason. My wanderings, this is towards the end, took me to the most remote areas of London, into outlying parts of the metropolis, which I would never otherwise have seen. And when dawn came, I would go back to Whitechapel on the underground, together with all the other poor souls who flow from the suburbs towards the centre at that time of day. As I passed through the stations, I thought several times that among the passengers coming towards me in the tiled passages, on the escalators plunging steeply into the depths, or behind the grey windows of a train just pulling out, I saw a face known to me from some much earlier part of my life, but I could never say whose it was. And that says quite a lot, really. The exact layout of, of uh, Vera's flat in Prague, um, the laws governing the Jews in Prague when his mother is deported, and the contents of the Holocaust Museum at Terezin. They're all given that kind of very detailed treatment, which convinces you while you feel afloat, because you don't know what it's about, really. What am I being convinced of, you ask yourself. This almost too solid reality of things becomes even more surreal as Austerlitz describes his dreams, one in particular of his parents coming back to their flat in Prague, but not aged 90 or 100 as he knows they would now have been had they lived, but in their mid-30s as they were when disaster struck. His final comment only adds to our sense of disturbance and unreality, extract six. It does not seem to me, Austerlitz added, that we understand the laws governing the return of the past. But I feel more and more as if time did not exist at all. Only various spaces interlocking according to the rules of a higher form of stereometry. Well, I don't know what it means, stereometry, so I had to look it up. The measurement of solid bodies, between which the living and the dead can move back and forth as they like. And the longer I think about it, the more it seems to me that we, who are still alive, are unreal in the eyes of the dead, that only occasionally in certain lights and atmospheric conditions do we appear in their field of vision. As far back as I can remember, said Austerlitz, I have always felt as if I had no place in reality, as if I were not there at all. 
Another way Sebald attempts to convey this unconveyable message is through imagery, and this is where I think you get the greatest fun in the book. The piling up of metaphor and symbol into much of it into nightmare symbols. I've already referred to the prevalence of railway stations and trains in this book with their associations of displacement, restlessness, impermanence, among other things. Chief of all these mentioned, of course, is the kinder transport. That is perhaps the symbol, isn't it, of displacement. And fortifications. We've just looked at some fortifications, which are introduced early on with Brindonk and his bleak conclusion as he thinks of all the prisoners who've been in that camp. Even now, when I try to remember them, when I look back at the crab-like plan of Brindonk, the darkness does not lift, but becomes yet heavier as I think how little we can hold in mind how everything is constantly lapsing into oblivion with every extinguished life, how the world is, as it were, draining itself, in that the history of countless places and objects which themselves have no power of memory is never heard, never described, or passed on. And though there are no formal mazes, I've mentioned also the the fact that we feel lost. That, I haven't got it here, that one. Um, the Bibliothèque Nationale, which is a wonderful, silly building in Paris. I don't know if any of you know it. And apparently he describes it with great relish. You have to go up to the top to get in, and then when you've got to the top of this huge building, you have to go down again to get into the library. And all the doors look like windows. Nobody knows where the doors are. It's quite an extraordinary description. It's a tour de force, really. Um, it's not my favorite place. Oh, yes, wait a minute. Eyes, yes. Clocks, of course. Clocks in the railway station. And also the eyes. When the narrator, who has just visited that Nocturama where all the night creatures are kept, says, all I remember of the denizens of the Nocturama, he reports, is that several of them had strikingly large eyes, and the fixed inquiring gaze found in certain painters and philosophers who seek to penetrate the darkness which surrounds us purely by means of looking and thinking. Accompanying this, this is references to mirrors and windows which normally suggests the possibility, of course, of seeing out of clarification, but which, of course, symbolically, in Austerlitz's case, are blocked up from the inside when he's a child, so he can't see out of the window. A sense of oppression, of blurring, of not seeing clearly, therefore, is portrayed. Even the photographs Austerlitz has shown by his Welsh foster parents are of people drowned many years before. But before I show you that photograph of one poor little girl drowned many years before, let me show you something that I found on the internet. If I go back and you look at the eyes, can you see? One of them is the philosopher Wittgenstein, and the other one is, um, I think he's, yes, Ludwig Wittgenstein and Jan Peter Tripp, who I think was a philosopher, I'm not sure, perhaps a poet. But it's, it's very exciting, isn't it, when you find that kind of connection. And then there is the poor little girl. Um, Austerlitz's reaction when he's shown these photographs of the people who were drowned in the village where he's living under a flood at one point. And he looks at this poor little girl and he said, at, at, I... I, used to, I often felt as if I, too, had been submerged in that dark water. And like the poor souls of Vernwy, must keep my eyes wide open to catch a faint glimmer of light far above me. Just enough time to finish. To Sebald's mind, all is symbolic. Even something as solid 
as the new Bibliothèque Nationale has this, which is meant for enlightenment, is, is a source of complete confusion to everybody who uses it. Austerlitz deals with so many themes, time, loss, abandonment, memory, love, lack of love, displacement, and above all, exile, and yet, what ultimately is it about? The ultimate effect of this novel is corrosive and unsettling, and we find ourselves drawn into the void, psychological, personal, and ultimately sociological as well, with almost no tools with which to extricate ourselves. Sebalt has done something quite remarkable. He's written a historical novel that appears to exist outside of history, and yet this represents less an escape and more an exile. That dislocation is both the tragedy of Austerlitz, the character, and the wonder of Austerlitz, the book. Thank you.